Okay, so the, all of the course that we've dealt with so far has sort of been building up to this point now where we can actually deal with dinosaurs as a group. I, I broke away at one point and we did talk about how they fit within the archosaurs, but we didn't really go into depth about uh, what sort of interesting characteristics a group has other than to just place them within the larger branch of the tree. And so now that we have sort of an earth of, uh, of the, the Triassic period, we can really start to talk about dinosaurs as a group. And I think so this is the real meat of the class in that way. So it takes a while to get here, but I think that the point of that is to just give you better background about what, what these things actually deal with. So today what we're really going to talk about is dinosaur evolution but most of it is going to be directed at the Triassic. Okay, so we are going to continue to talk about dinosaur evolution in the rest of the course. It's just that for the purposes of this stuff, we're going to deal with dinosaur evolution in primarily the Triassic period right now. And that's because the Triassic period is the point at which we're going to separate our lineage into the Sauritia and the Ornithischia. And we're going to use those classifications. They appear to be very, very strong classifications. We're going to use those classifications for the rest of the course. And actually, we're going to deal first when we get into the dinosaur groupings. If you've looked at the syllabus, we're going to deal with the Ornithischia first, not with the Saurischians. The Saurischians, of course, are the the uh, the T. Rexes of the world. I'm going to show you this. So this is in the paper, the Sereno paper uh, that's online. I'm also going to show you this later in the course as well. But it's a fairly good phylogenetic tree of the dinosaurs. And one of the things that's really really nice about phylogenetic trees that I find most useful is that when people put the outlines of the animals on the trees themselves. And so what we always have is starting at the left hand side or at the right hand side if you're on this side of the tree. As you move down these steps you go into, you go from primitive groups, so basal lineages, to more and more advanced groups. And when you have outlines you can actually see how those characteristics within the groups persisted or, or changed in evolutionary time, right? Because the basal groups are going to represent the most primitive end members of that group. And these, uh, these lineages all the way down at the, at the base of those fans are going to be the most derived and so they're going to have picked up the most characteristics. So one of the things that you're going to see a lot of today is that a lot of these lineages are going to start small and they're going to start as bipeds. Okay, so in general they're bipedal. You can really see that here. Uh, just so you know if you've read the book, this group here, Eoraptor, no longer belongs to the theropods. It now sits on this branch. It's now the most basal sauropod lineage that we have uh, found to date. So as an un unsurprising, right, that Eoraptor looks a lot like these primitive ornithischians, which look a lot like um, primitive raptors. Right? These are all, they all look relatively the same as we get to the bottom. So we think that theropods probably look a lot like the most primitive members of the dinosaur group. That is somewhat debatable at the moment. But in any case, uh, we also, the, the last remaining lineage actually survives within the theropod lineage and is one of these very, very derived end members within the theropod lineage. One of the things, this is an older paper, so this is about, what, approaching 20 years old now. You will see that there are no feathers drawn on these guys, okay, and, and that uh, we, we know is probably no longer true. Almost certainly the theropods, uh, most if not all, had some sort of feather uh, potential. Probably when they were relatively small, they all had feathers. Uh, and that seems to be the case because we're finding feathers now in these basal lineages on the ornithischian sides and we have some evidence in the footprints that there are also feathers on these guys. So it's probable that all these groups have access to feathers whether they express them as adults or not is a different question and we're going to talk about that in a separate lecture because there's so much uh, that we need to talk about when we talk about uh, feathers and the appearance of them within the fossil record. We're going to talk about dinosaurs today, I promise, but where I'm actually going to start today is just outside the group. So the next nearest group that we have lots of numbers of, and also some of the lineages that are now extinct that we have very, very few members of, but that are very, very closely related to dinosaurs. So we're going to step out, just outside of the dinosaur group, and we're going to then step back into them. So as we move through those groups, we're going to re-enter into the dinosaurian lineages. Uh, that, is, that is going to allow us to have an outgroup to compare it to, right? So these older groups that are going to have other primitive features, we're going to be able to, to compare them to dinosaurs and see if dinosaurs are retaining primitive features or if they're gaining new ones. And that's the advantage of having these outgroups. Modern day outgroups, so these, the outgroups we're really going to talk about today are extinct. Modern day outgroups are basically crocodiles, right? Those are outside of the dinosaur lineage if you want to study dinosaurs. 
the next nearest member is a crocodile or an all alligator, same difference. Um, and as a result, we don't have that, we don't have as much power as we might like. So what is, what are the next nearest groups? What is the next nearest group? Well, I, I actually, this is kind of fun. The pterosaurs actually turn out to be very, very closely related to dinosaurs. This is more recently that we've placed them here. Uh, they used to float around. We weren't sure where they, they ended up, but we now think very strongly that they're very closely related to dinosaurs. And then there's these other groups of animals that we're actually going to look at today as well, which are called dinosaur morphs. I'm going to put that in quotes because if we don't include dinosaurs within dinosaur morphs, then it becomes a paraphyletic grouping. If you understand that dinosaurs are in fact a dinosaur morph, which does in some ways make sense, uh, then that actually becomes a monophyletic grouping. But for, the, for most people, dinosaur morph is used to represent any lizard-like animal that looks like a dinosaur that's closely related to them, and that wouldn't be a real grouping. In any case, let's start, let's always start out here with the pterosaurs. You know this lineage, these right here, right? This is the crocodiles and alligators. So this is a, a group of animals that give rise to this modern lineage of crocodiles and alligators. All the other stuff that fits in between them is lost. So we have relatively few members. Archosaurs, which is what these groups actually belong to, actually mean ruling reptile, but we don't have very many archosaur lineages left. Uh, only a few managed to make it through the Cretaceous uh, uh, extinction event. And so as a result, even though we consider them ruling reptiles, and to a degree they are by their diversity, they don't represent a large number of different lineages in modern day um, ecosystems. Alright, so the pterosaurs are actually a really interesting group in and of themselves. I find them sort of incredibly fascinating. There, is a num there are very few scientists who work on them. Part of that is because if dinosaur bones are rare, pterosaur bones are even rarer, and pterosaur bones are vanishingly rare. Uh, you can study your whole life looking at dinosaur bones and going out on expeditions and potentially never collect or only collect a very small number of pterosaur bones. They just, they are not really built to survive. Just like bird bones, they're also very hollow, and so once the, en the animal dies, these light frame things will get crushed and destroyed very, very easily. It's hard to get uh, fossils of them. We do have fossils in some cases. They do actually show up in marine sediments uh, fairly well. Uh, but the amount of pterosaurs we have relative to some other stuff is more limited. You may hear people call these dinosaurs. These are absolutely not dinosaurs. They are 100% not dinosaurs. They are related to dinosaurs in that they are closely grouped with them but they are not dinosaurs, and there is no question about that. The Jurassic Park may sell you pterosaurs and call them dinosaurs, they are not dinosaurs, um, don't be confused. Pterosaurs are the uh, first vertebrate lineage to, be, to gain flight. There are only two other lineages that have managed to do that. Birds, of course, are one, and then the last one is, what's the other lineage? That has bats. Bats, yep, bats are the other one that have have gained flight. Those are the only three vertebrate lineages that have gained flight, uh, and the bats are the last to the table, and birds appear to gain flight uh, in this sort of unusual fashion. We're not entirely sure how it went about, but they don't appear to be uh, particularly good at flight initially, but really stumble across it. Pterosaurs, as far as we can tell, uh, appear to gain flight relatively rapidly and get really good at it um, fairly early. We're also going to use these guys, like I said, as an outgroup. There's a number of reasons why that is. I do want you to take a look at these images here. These are reconstruct modern reconstructions of, with a scientific artist whose who's, one of his primary research goals is to reconstruct pterosaurs as closely to the real life image as he expected to find them. And so he spends vast amount, he actually does uh, pterosaur work, he examines fossils, he publishes papers, and then he also makes these amazing artistic uh, works. Uh, Mark Whittington, and he spends, like I said, enormous amounts of time working to try to find out what these animals would have looked like. And the, we are now approaching a point where there is enough interest that color is now really interesting to people, and some of these colors are no longer fantasized. These are actually based on reconstructions from fossils. So we actually know that some pterosaurs had striping on the head. So we actually have a fairly good idea about what these animals look like. So we're really getting pretty close to getting a good example of what these animals might have looked like. For instance, these guys, uh, they were hypothesized to be a, basically a bat, uh, a bat niche. So they probably, they probably flew really close to nightfall or just when the sun was coming up and as a result they're shaded very darkly. This is a great example of what pterosaur fossils look like. So this is an entirely articulated animal. This is a relatively primitive member of that group. 
lots of little, te these are actually fairly large teeth, but lots of, of teeth within the mouth, lots of bones, and a very, very, very long tail. There's another, a bunch of other characteristics. Again, we're not going to deal very closely with this group, but I want you to understand what primitive, what groups that, that would eventually be similar to dinosaurs and would evolve into um, these dinosaurian lineages, how they started. And so pterosaurs are probably um, a lineage that have some of those things. These big long bones, right, are the wings, right? What, and what is this actually, this long extension composed finger. of them? Which finger? Ring, uh, ring finger. Ring finger, yep. Pterosaurs are, have an enormously elongated ring finger, uh, which, is, which takes up the length of the entire forearm. So all of the arm is shorter than the one long ring finger in most groups. They also have these very obvious wings, right? So you can see that there are wings here. You can in fact see in this fossil, you can see the folds where the wing, the wing membrane folded on itself. And if you examine those very closely, they have what are called microfilaments in them, which help to actually hold the wing open when the wing opens up. So they have very, very good wing control. And those micro elements will allow them to twist the wings. Uh, there are actually some membranes down here as well, so they get some a uh, uh, little bit of control in the back there. And then they have another little, they have a bone that they evolve uh, right on the elbow that allows them to fold up a very, very small uh, portion of membrane in front of their wing. And that works in a very similar way to what we're going to talk about later, which is called the bastard wing in birds. And it provides uh, this li just a little bit of difference in lift, which can cause the animal to stall very quickly, which is really, really useful when you want to land. So you can flip it up and down very quickly, which can cause you to stall basically as you're about to touch the ground instead of just belly flopping into the ground. Um, were the wings feathered or were they more like bat wings? These wings are going to be more like skin. So they're going to be more like bat wings. Bat wings are a little different because their elements are supported by all of the fingers. So if you look at bat yeah. hands, they look really unusual. These guys are actually supported by only one element, and so they have very stiffened rods within them. So it wouldn't be a one-to-one. -one. You would notice the difference. Mm -hmm. If I gave you a pterosaur wing in real life and a bat wing, you, would, you could identify this is a pterosaur wing. This is not like a bat wing. But similar in that way, exposed skin. Membrane itself. Very much more like a membrane, yep. We also have some really cool, this is another one, right, some very, very cool stuff here. Uh, this one's actually li was died just as it was either, it had an egg within the body that was probably squished out of the body, and that gives us information also about the eggs of these guys. Unlike dinosaur eggs, dinosaur eggs are, what, how would you describe a dinosaur egg? Soft buttery. Is it? Nope. <laughs> have you ever had a chicken egg? Yes. And what are they? They're really hard, right? And so dinosaur eggs tend to be actually very hard. Uh, these, what are crocodile eggs like? Leathery. Leathery. So now we have a conundrum because one of the groups that we have says, and it's a very derived group, says it's a very, very hard egg. Crocodile eggs, on the other hand, very, very leathery. And so at some point, hard eggs must have been picked up. But if hard eggs were picked up, were they picked up within the dinosaur lineage? So do all dinosaurs share hard eggs? Or is it picked up outside the lineage? And so we need an out group to look at that. Well, it turns out if you find pterosaur eggs, which you can, right, here's an example of one right here at the bottom. So this is a female pterosaur, and that might explain why she doesn't have a big crest on the back of her head. Um, if you look at her eggs, it's actually very leathery. So hard eggs appears to be a characteristic that's probably associated very closely with dinosaurs. So it was either picked up uh, uh, be just before dinosaurs or just as that sort of lineage was, uh, was appearing. Pterosaur eggs are very, are very leathery. They also produce offspring that are very, very well developed. So these offspring are effectively miniature adults the day they are born. What are birds like? They like their adult or very different from the adult when they're born? Very different. Very different. Yes, so this is a very different strategy. So birds do something very different. Instead of saying, okay, well, I want you have to get big enough and strong enough the day that you're born to take off, most bur birds embark on a strategy of feed and protect so that you can grow larger and then you can solidify bone and make it much stronger. So you get much, much, much more growth options available to you. That also means that you can focus just on growing as a juvenile um, or just as a chick, right? Because you don't have to worry about food. Your parent is going to bring it to you. And so all you should be doing is worrying about growth. Pterosaurs probably don't do that. They probably have some parental care because we suspect um, Parental care belongs to archosaurs as a group, right? Crocodiles and alligators show amazingly protective care of their offspring. But they protect the offspring in that they provide protection for the area. And they, they will protect the offspring when they are near the adult. 
but they don't go out of their way uh, necessarily to leave the offspring in one area and bring them food, for instance. That's not something they do. And that's probably true for pterosaurs as well. Probably adults are protecting the eggs, or maybe one adult is protecting the eggs after they're laid, and then these small animals are hatching and they have to make their life right away. Uh, and there's probably fairly high mortality as a result of that. These guys probably have very, very high mortality as young animals, and they seem to take a fairly long time to get to adult sizes. So unlike birds, which reach adult sizes in months at a time, right, pterosaurs probably take on the order of maybe three to 10 years, depending on the size of the animal. So it's a fairly slow lifestyle. Uh, flight does require probably endothermy. So pterosaurs appear to be endothermic. Does that mean that they're endothermic like dinosaurs? Mm, maybe. Uh, one thing you'll notice here is that uh, the pterosaurs have a lot of um, stuff around their bodies. You don't see a lot of exposed skin on the body. And that's because they have a thing that are called pycnofibers, which may in fact be uh, feathers, but they may be their own, their own thing. And this is one of the problems we have with understanding where feathers evolve and why we need to spend a whole lecture separately on it. But pterosaurs are clearly covered in a downy material, and they would look, as a result, very similar to something like a bat, where you have a lot of hair on the body. And so pterosaurs clearly aren't basking during the day. They're clearly active during the day, and they don't need to pick up heat from the sun. So as effectively, they're, they are endotherms in their own right. Whether that evolved independently or was brought on um, or was partially evolving, and then pterosaurs took off onto a lineage that needed it, that's all debatable. And here's a good example of that leathery egg, right? This egg got pushed down a little bit, and then it got, it got turned into a rock. Sorry, that pterosaur never hatched, so it died. Pterosaurs are going to disappear at the end of the Cretaceous. None of them make it through the end, of, make it through the Cretaceous period, and I'll show you why that is the case. Oop, here we go. So one of the things we also want to know is how do pterosaurs move? How do they walk around? Right, all the I'm telling you, theropods are primitive dinosaurs. Right, they, these belong to the most primitive lineage of dinosaurs. I've also shown you a lot of pictures that dinosaurs are primitively bipedal, but are are they? Right, let's look at an outgroup. Well. It turns out pterosaurs are absolutely not bipedal. They're definitely quadrupedal. Here's that hand. So if you count the fingers in here, you'll notice that there is one long finger missing, and that is because it extends out into the back. But here is the foot, right? So they are clearly walking around on hands and feet. Um, and this is a trackway. We have lots of these trackways, actually. So this animal here is walking along this pathway. It's probably entering a colony. They're probably roosting like colonies, like birds, that probably derive multiple times um, within these lineages of small, soft-bodied animals that are probably very vulnerable to predations. They probably roost in very isolated areas away from other animals. This is probably a trackway where an animal is walking back after it's landed to go to uh, a potentially a nest or something like that. Unclear, or maybe it's just resting. In any case, uh, we have landed. We actually have places where we know that they've just landed, and you can actually see the imprints where they've just touched down and then start to walk away from it. And those seem to, to be a little bit different from these standard walkways. But this here is actually the walkway, and you can see there's a variety of different sizes of pterosaurs within this colony, right? There's lots and lots of different sized tracks moving through there. So one of the questions, of course, that people have dealt with for a long time is how they actually go about walking. We've got belly sliders. There's this weird bipedal thing where they walk around sort of awkwardly on their back legs. You can't get them to actually do that. There's this thing where apparently they have to run all the time like a dinosaur. And you can also see, so they evolved this, this long toe that comes out to the back that actually holds a membrane so they couldn't separate their legs like that. They, they don't run. Um, they use that membrane to help stabilize them in flight. Backs is another, another surface. So this is actually connected to that so they wouldn't have been able to run like this. This is a more recent development where the, the, the finger actually folds all the way up. Remember, this is the ring finger folds all the way up, and then the hands splay out to the side um, with the feet pointing in towards, the, in towards the head in that case. And that appears uh, to be the, the, the way that they, in fact, move because of those trackways. They definitely not but belly sliding around. They don't do that. And we also have some indication that some of them basically didn't walk, uh, that they appear to be obligate gliders, not terribly different from the way albatross work. And probably when they touch down, they touch down just to breed, and then they're gone again. So they actually don't have fingers left. And they just have one big <coughs> finger, um, and they're probably completely incapable of moving on the ground. So this is how they would have walked. You can see that they actually evolve a way to rotate the wrist out to the side. Rotation of wrist is really important to, uh, to flying animals. Birds also rotate a very special type of wrist, which allows it to fold in a very specific fashion. 
And then these long fingers would have folded up to protect the wing membrane uh, so the animal wouldn't have damaged the wings while it's walking around. You can see they have these big long necks and they probably would have been very adept, uh, many of them, very adept at walking on the ground uh, and interacted in a very uh, traditional lizard way in the sense that they would be fighting over food on the ground and then they would fly off to go somewhere else. So pterosaurs are a little unusual. I'm going to show you why. Uh, because they get a lot bigger than modern birds, but they were still definitely flying. So this is the largest pterosaur we currently know about. This animal would easily meet the eyes of a giraffe. These are the largest, again, that we know about. There are probably larger ones out there. And estimates put uh, the length of time it could stay airborne on the scale of about uh, half or all of the world's diameter. So they would have been able to fly, circumnavigate the globe on a full stomach. So they are enormously powerful animals and you would not have wanted to be in front of these guys. These are almost certainly meso, meso, uh, um, mesopresidors, so they sit right in the middle of the food chain, and they would have eaten everything that was smaller than them. So they probably uh, fly hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers to important breeding sites, potentially, for dinosaurs. Land, consume enormous numbers of dinosaurs, take off, go somewhere else, do the same thing, look for carcasses, that kind of stuff as they're flying around. Yeah, these are not, these are not friendly in that way. So would that mean that a species like that, Cephalosaurus, would it have a cosmopolitan distribution? Yeah, so if you get to this size, right, if you're flying the globe, then your population is one. You just have a population of the globe. Now, you might have local populations that exchange uh, only in certain continents. So they may follow very distinct paths, but effectively you're going to have some crossing over and breeding between those, so your population will act as one. This is Quetzalcoatlus, but there are actually a number of other species like this. So this is not the only very, very large pterosaur we have, and Quetzalcoatlus is only unusual in the sense that it's slightly larger than the other ones we have. Not that much different. Other questions about this guy? It also turns out that these are the niches that these things are filling up at the end of the Cretaceous. Enormous size flying animals. That's not going to be a good place to be when you have large-scale ecosystem collapses. Okay? You don't want to be a large-bodied high energy requiring long distance traveler. That's going to be all sorts of bad stuff for you. So it's not really that surprising that at the end of the Cretaceous these guys go extinct. Why did they evolve to fit those, those large body sizes? That's a different question. Uh, and we don't know entirely why we don't see a lot of smaller pterosaurs towards the end of the Cretaceous. So how do you actually get an animal like Quetzalcoatlus off the ground or these very large pterosaurs? Well, they launch very similar to the way a quadruped launches. I guess I can advance the slide. Uh, what they're actually going to do is kick off with their back legs, and then as their head starts to run into the ground, they will then force with their arms down and away, and that will literally throw them up into the air. Uh, and at that point, then, they'll have enough room, and they can start to flap their arms. The important thing to note about this is that the evolution of flight in all mam animals, as far as we can tell, is very closely related to uh, the way in which they evolve on the ground. So birds appear to, to launch in a way that raptors run. Um, it's a very different style of launching, and bats launch very differently from this too, and that appears to be very characteristic of the way in which they evolve as sort of small animals creeping along caves that would have jumped off of the cave and then spread out to do a glide to somewhere else. And so that's a very different style of flight than this one. These appear to be uh, quadrupedal animals that were probably launching from one tree to another, and as they do that, they're gaining some ability to control that launch uh, as they move around. At least that's our best guess right now. So these animals are very, very interesting, um, and I'm gonna we'll wrap it up uh, over here. Uh, but we, we are not going to spend more time on them, unfortunately. And I really do encourage you, if you think that pterosaurs are interesting, to go learn more about them. They really are fantastic, uh, and they come with all these really strange adaptations, uh, and they have a wildly impressive uh, uh, head ornamentation, which is probably just under sexual selection. But it gets to the point where animals have head ornamentation that's longer than the body in some cases. So they become sort of excessive in their own right. We think, and again, I'm going to mention this, they're probably endothermic. Uh, they're endothermic in some way, is what I will tell you. How that actually fits within the larger dinosaur history, again, we're going to need a lecture to sort of talk about that. Absolutely, these are quadrupeds. Probably minimal care for offspring. 
Eggs are soft shelled, and the characteristic you've definitely seen about these guys is that they eat things. They're very predatory. We don't have herbivorous pterosaurs as far as we can tell. That's not particularly surprising. Uh, we don't really have a lot of herbivorous flying animals. It's not a good, it's not a good thing to be in general. It's hard to get your money's worth. Okay, so the pterosaurs are going to fall out here, right? They're going to be closely related to dinosaurs. And now we're going to deal with this group. Again, I'm going to put them in quotes, dinosaur morphs. You're going to hear the term dinosaur morph, and I do want you to understand that it's not a real grouping, but it represents something important, which is lineages that are closely associated with this separate lineage that we're going to call dinosaurs. And these dinosaur morphs are really going to be an, a, a, an outgroup uh, that we are not going to be able to even beat with pterosaurs because they're going to be even close to the dinosaurs. But there's going to be a couple of problems with them. One, we're going to have very, very few of them. Two, they're going to be very fragmentary. Um, and three, none of them persist to the modern day. So we don't have any of these other closely related lineages around with us. And as a result, uh, we have to rely on lineages for which we have more information. And pterosaurs fall into that. But we need to at least look at these guys before we persist onwards because they do represent a relatively important component of this. The dinosaur Morpha, right, this is that group. Uh, they're probably quadrupedal, uh, maybe they appear bipedal. We're, I, would, I would say even while writing this, I wrote quadrupedal. I would or I, I wrote bipedal with an asterisk, I would tend to lean towards the closest relatives of dinosaurs now probably being quadrupedal, even though we think primitive dinosaurs were bipedal. Uh, but there's clearly a lot of play going on here. This is a topic that's definitely in hot debate right now. Almost certainly they're carnivorous. Again, this is another topic that's debated right now. They may have actually been primitively at least closest to the dinosaur lineage herbivorous, so not entirely clear about that. We think that the primitive condition is what we call the reptile pelvis, which is the serichia, the theropods, where it's split apart. But again, uh, that, that also appears to be somewhat up in the air. If, there, if the closest relatives of dinosaurs were in fact herbivorous, then ornithischian pelvises uh, were in fact the more primitive member. This feathered or insulated thing, I, I think at this point we have enough information to say that they're probably insulated with some sort of feather. It would have been a very primitive form of feather. Uh, but they are not in the sense that you think of a bird being very, very tight control of body temperature. They tend to lean towards this ectothermic with some endothermic control. So they're able during the day to control temperatures internally to some degree, but they're not fully able to control their temperatures and they fluctuate up and down regularly. And uh, this also is not true anymore. We used to say they were from South America. They, that's not true. Uh, the most primitive members we have actually right now, I think, belong in Poland. So. so here's a good example of a dinosaur morph. This animal is, to, to, to a layman, this would absolutely be a dinosaur. And they, they would be forgiven for thinking that. This looks a lot like a dinosaur. It's really, 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 really similar to the way a dinosaur works. And in fact, you have to really be a specialist to come in and tease apart what makes this not. Even if you look at something like the head, right, that looks like a dinosaur. You really have to look at some of the finer details of the bone to really determine, oh yeah, it doesn't quite have these features, and therefore as a close member, it is related, but it is not that thing. Um, and the other thing I want you to notice here is how long these, these forearms are. Unusually long, in fact. And this is, I, I really like this artist's reconstruction here. The color, the color in this case we're not sure about, but I really like the reconstruction otherwise. Uh, the arms are being used here as a sort of bipedal, quadrupedal thing with the foot placed flatly on the ground. And that we're fairly confident about. The foot is, is completely flat to the ground. Uh, and the arms are probably functioning to do both quadrupedal motion and to manipulate things in front of the animal, probably prey that is grasping, which would have been small mammal-like animals, right? So at this point in our timeline of uh, animals, unfortunately, mammals are now the tasty treats, which dinosaur or dinosaur-like things are hunting, and no longer dominate those niches. The other important things to note are uh, you're already seeing losses of fingers, right? You know of a lineage of dinosaurs that gives up almost every finger very quickly, but you also know of another lineage that has also modified finger number, right? How many fingers are in a chicken hand? How many fingers do chickens grow? 
It's some number between one and five. Four. It's not four, three. and it's not one. Two. It's it's three. <laughs> it's, it is. It's okay. It's Don't worry. Five. It's not. It wasn't a test. No one lost points because they didn't know. I wasn't writing names down. It's. It looks like two. If you pull open a chicken wing, you will notice that there look like there are two fingers. But what actually happens is two of the fingers fuse together. That's that super large finger that you see at the very edge of your wing. And then there's another little finger that sticks up and away from that, and that is the other finger in that hand. So uh, addition or loss of digits within the Archosaur lineage appears a relatively common feature. And it seems to be related to how much you use your fingers for prey capture. For birds, they needed a much stronger finger for flight, and so you see the fingers fuse in that case. In these animals, you can already see that they've probably lost one. They're, they're probably not using that finger for capture. When you look, we're going to look at some of these primitive dinosaurs. They look stupid in the sense that they have a finger that looks like it's not there, and it's very similar to the way that your pinky toe works. It just it looks dumb. It doesn't seem to function, <laughs> and it doesn't. It doesn't really have a function anymore. Uh, it's just a holdover from the fact that your ancestors had five toes, right? And so it hangs around, but it isn't. It is there is actually a, a slight bit of selection to remove it in a sense, right? There is some small amount of selection, but it takes so long to get rid of structures and to gain them that you would have to go through many, 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 many thousands of generations before you might expect to see that completely lost from a population. And so that's the same thing you're seeing here. You're seeing evolution on the way, right? It's on the way to removing that finger, but you have these weird additions that hang out. Here's another animal, another dinosaur morph. And the thing to note here uh, that I'd really like you to look at is how flat and wide the head is, and it looks a lot like a crocodile head. And in fact, uh, that seems to be very characteristic of archosaurs. Uh, what we have in, the, in that case is that archosaurs that obtain uh, adult-like features very, very early look more like crocodiles. And archosaurs that attain juvenile characteristics and persist with those juvenile characteristics longer look more and more and more and more like birds. And so when you look at tiny things like tiny baby velociraptors, they look a lot like baby birds, but pretty quickly they get those features are lost to adult archosaur characteristics. And by the time you get to birds, though, the, the, the opposite is true. No longer do we retain adult archosaur characteristics. We look entirely like a juvenile archosaur. So birds look like juveniles, um, and dinosaurs in general, other than the birds, look more like adult archosaurs. Uh, they don't seem to, to uh, they, don't, they, are, they are good examples of archosaurs in that way, uh, and not sort of uh, the bastards that the bird lineage becomes, right, with its own thing on the outside and very different from everybody else. So this is, again, a good example of this guy. Um, we have some characteristics that, again, make it look sort of like a dinosaur. Lots of openings in the skull, uh, these very long uh, lower jaw with lots of hinging. Uh, weirdly, again, these long forearms that are sort of half bipedal, half quadrupedal, right? This is sort of where that, that, that confusion comes around. Probably a reptile-like pelvis in this case. Uh, and then on the back of it, we appear to have these dermal scales that would have looked uh, a lot like crocodile armor. So it would have it probably, this is actually probably a relatively good example of what an animal like this would have looked like. So it looks like a running crocodile. Right? And th again, not, not necessarily a surprise. You have these members that are picking up characteristics of these other group, or have other members that are related, and so they bring these characteristics through time. And then you, you can either continue to express those characters or lose them or, or gain your own. So when we are in the dinosaur morpha, what we want to know is where is it a dinosaur and where is it a dinosaur morpha? This is sort of a largely useless definition, uh, but it does allow, it. We're, we can use it to some degree, and we're going to mostly ignore it because we don't need it. We're not dealing with dinosaur morphas except for dinosaurs. So we were not going to use it except at this very specific time. And it, what we use today is what we call a monophyletic grouping where both pigeons um, and triceratops uh, are present, and the, the last member that is common to both is included within that group. So if we were to find a dinosaur morpha that did not include uh, pigeons and triceratops as the last, as <coughs> it, it's the most common grouping, it would fall just outside, and if it did, it would fall just inside. But for most cases, it's sort of irrelevant, because we're not going to run into a situation where we're going to be that close to that node. Right? That's only important if you're very, very close. Once you're outside of that, it's not a big deal. And this just comes down to the fact that as humans, we're trying to name things into boxes, which is fine, 
but in a biological realm, they're continuous, right? And so it's, you can't just outright say, well, they're this, then they're this, right? It just is a continuous uh, set of situations. Again, mostly what we're not going to be terribly concerned about the dinosaur morphos. I just want you to be aware of what they look like and how similar they are to the dinosaurs um, and the fact that dinosaurs are therefore modified versions of these. But if you deal with, if you ever even see these in a museum, which would be a great feat in and of itself because they're not that common, uh, then you'll know that they aren't quite within that lineage yet. All right, so where do we fit right now on our timeline, right? We're going to keep looking at this. Well, the dinosaur morphos, the fossils we have of them fall right here into the middle Triassic and towards the late end of that. Probably somewhere around 235, maybe 240 million years ago, something like that. If you, uh, one of the things we, we're going to look at now is where do the dinosaurs actually fall? So where do we actually find dinosaurs? Apparently my arrows are appearing and disappearing. Well, we're going to look just a little bit beyond that, literally just a few million years beyond what we just looked at for those dinosaur morphos. And when you do that, you find dinosaurs. So this is your first dinosaur in this class, really. And this is Herrerasaurus. And Herrerasaurus is really important, uh, not just because it represents a basal lineage of dinosaurs, but because it is so unusual relative to what you see in other dinosaurs. Let's just start with the head, for instance. Look up here at this skull. Uh, and one of the things you can see is how much bone is present within that head, right? This is not characteristic that you will see in most other dinosaurs. You will see them mostly reduce that. Look at these extremely long arms. And then if you come down to this dot bottom picture, what you should see is that there's a little tiny tone or a little tiny fingernail right there on the bottom of the hand. So here are the three fingers that birds are going to get. And here's the fourth finger that birds are not going to get because that will be lost long before their lineage appears on the earth. The other thing that is important to note about this guy, here I've shown you a reconstruction with what we would call uh, proto feathers or, or primitive type 1 feathers, and those are probably right. We think now that Herrerasaurus was probably covered with some amount of down to some degree. Uh, whether the legs were exposed like this or not, that's debatable. We'll need more fossils to actually find out if that's the case. We'll need skin impressions to actually know. But what we do know from, anim from birds that spend a lot of time in forest conditions, this is characteristic to have the legs exposed with a protective shield of scales in front of it that are very, very large and flat. And we know from dinosaur foot imprints of theropods, of which this member is absolutely one of them now, uh, that that is also characteristic of the group in general. And we see that in animals from T-Rex all the way down to uh, animal, probably animals like Herrerasaurus. So Herrerasaurus was found, this is, Paul Cer this is Paul Sereno's, one of his big, well, I shouldn't say his contribution. He, he has made a number of contributions to this field of dinosaurs, but Herrerasaurus is one of the most important, I would argue. Uh, he works up at the University of Chicago right now, and I think he was voted like one of the sexiest men alive in 2015, <laughs> which is great. That's unrelated to the dinosaur work. But he actually, he, this, this work of finding these early primitive dinosaurs is something he really went out to go and do, and Herrerasaurus is the result of that. And so we've learned a lot about what a primitive theropod dinosaur looks like. And it looks like a theropod, but weirdly so, in that some of the features that you think of with theropods uh, are not yet there, and some things like this additional uh, finger off the side are still present within these guys. So this is, this, actually this color is also fairly uh, interesting and I like the way that they've done that here by adding lots of different colors. Remember dinosaurs are very, very visually oriented animals and so color would absolutely have, probably have played a role in this animal's lifespan as well. And here's a good example of the bones because they've included the belly ribs here. So that's good. I'm glad that they put those in. You should always have the belly ribs. This is Eoraptor and we were uncertain where Eoraptor fit I want to point out again, this is another one of these weird, weird holdovers. Look at this finger, right? We've already reduced one finger considerably, so we're ending up with three fingers. And this animal used to be placed within the theropods, and, and I think most people here, if, they, if I told you it was a dinosaur, would be very happy to place it with these cursorial predators, the theropods, right? This looks like sort of a small bird-like thing that's running around. The head's clearly too long, and it doesn't have a beak, and there's lots of teeth in there. But it does look bird-like in that way. But actually, on re-examination of the skull, it's actually got sauropod characteristics. So this is probably belongs to the sauropodomorpha. So this is probably what primitive sauropods look like. And they are probably cursorial, uh, 
uh, predatory animals that are running around on the forest uh, hunting down small lizards and small mammals and insects and that kind of thing. So this animal, although it looks a lot like a theropod, that makes sense that theropods and sauropods are closely related. This is actually what primitive sauropods probably start out looking like. So would it be included with the prosauropods or the... Prosauropods are probably, it depends on who groups it, and we haven't talked about it yet. Prosauropods, if they are a real group, then maybe, depending on how this falls in. Its placement within this group is fairly uncertain. It's definitely down at the bottom um, of that. So those animals I told you were in the 235 region. That's probably okay. Um, but we actually have a lot of fossils of footprints from prior to that that appear to be dinosaur footprints. And dinosaur footprints are very, very unique. Um, in the way that they walk because their feet are flat to the ground and they have a certain number of toes uh, pointing out away from them. And that's very different from other primitive archosaurs which tend to have the feet out to the side or like pterosaurs which tend to have this feet in these very highly convoluted fashions to allow for a flight. So we at least have some evidence that prior to the fossils of dinosaurs that there's a dinosaur-like animal which should not surprise you walking around the, the earth and that appears actually much, much earlier. So if you remember back um, to that lecture on mammals, if we have dinosaurs that appear relatively diverse when we see them in, a, in the fossil record, Eoraptor and Herrerasaurus are our earliest members, but they are uh, probably evolved much, much earlier, what will we call that model within evolution? They have a long history that we didn't capture in the, in the fossil record. That's called a long fuse. So we think that they evolved relatively early. They had a long period to diversify, were extremely rare throughout that, left very few fossil components, and then when we finally capture them within the fossil record, it's because they're coming, becoming more numerous, but it's not because they just suddenly appeared, it's because they were there originally, and they're finally starting to appear in our fossil record. It just took a long, long time for them to appear. So those footprints actually, uh, they end up down here, right? So if this is the footprints arguing that dinosaurs evolved uh, at about that time period. And this top orange arrow, which points to the end of the Middle Triassic, appears to suggest that that's, these are our first fossils. So dinosaurs probably do evolve relatively early in the Triassic. They're probably a component of the, the uh, post-apocalyptic fauna that start to reappear. There's probably a lot of diversity. Dinosaurs are one of the groups that, that appear. But at that point, they're probably a completely uh, a minute portion of that fauna and would be completely ancillary to all the other stuff that's going on. But they are going to persist and that's what, we can, that's what we're concerned about. All right, so like I said, Eoraptor down here is actually gonna jump over here now. So it's actually, it's probably gonna fall out. This group here is the prosauropods and here are the sauropods. Eoraptor is probably gonna fall out down here, although it may end up closer, it depends, on what we're gonna, it depends on what we're going to find out about it, as we know relatively little. The important thing to note about this too is that there's clearly a line between this, right? Here's the Ornithischia, and we're going to talk about them, and we're going to step through each one of these larger groupings. Um, we're going to start with these guys, the armors, the armor bearers, um, and then we're going to move through to the other things in there as well. So if you put this onto a tree of when things evolve, right? So the prior picture just put how they're related to each other and how distantly one is related from another. This actually places that relationship plus where they're located within time period. And what you can see is that by the time we get to about 235 million years ago, Dinosauria is well diversified. We have our two branches already. We have the Ornithischia and the Sauritia, which suggests that this point, Dinosauria appearing in 235 is wrong. It probably extends down here, right? Um, and that the branch point for these two is probably deeper. The issue with this is we don't really know when they branch from each other and we have a really hard time finding out because the fossils are vanishingly rare um, because they're not a large component yet. And so when they do become a large component, they're diversified already. It's almost as if they had already diversified. And that represents a, a really a missing fossil record, We're really missing that component. And so it's hard to place where these two groups uh, sit within uh, one another but I suspect that in the future we will have a much better understanding of that as we spend more time. You have to get the right outcrops of the right time period, and those outcrops are not terribly common, unfortunately. So these are the two groups that we're going to deal with for the rest of the course. Ornithischians have this very distinct pelvis with the pubis and the ischium lying parallel to one another. 
Sorishians have the primitive condition where the pubis is separated from the ischium, and the pubis in general points to the front. Which one do birds belong to? Yeah, they belong to this, and what do their pelvises look like? They actually look more like this. So this movement of the pubis has evolved multiple times, uh, but birds mu move the pubis in a different way than ornithischians, so you can tell the difference if you know what you're looking for. But this, this Sorishian uh, pelvis, which is the, the lizard hip pelvis, um, is probably the primitive condition. That's what lizards have. And it, it exposes uh, less of the body cavity, so it prevents you from having big, long guts in here. For a carnivore, no reason to worry about it. It allows a huge amount of muscle attachment. Herbivores, on the other hand, want more gut and aren't as concerned about muscle attachment, and so the rotation of the pubis to the back of the body really does allow them to open up this entire area for a hind gut, right, for a lot more fermentation stuff. So those are the two groups. There was actually just two groups here. This sauropod is added just for effect. It has a lot of its own distinct characters, but it belongs to this grouping here. Uh, this, these, here's the backwards facing pubis and here's the forward facing pubis. These are characters, you can see that we have a number of characters now that are uniting this group. So this is the ornithischian. All these numbers point to certain characteristics. That means that we've missed the branch point considerably. If we have a lot of characters that are already differentiating one group from another, it means the branch point must have been much earlier because those have been picked up sequentially. Right? So we've lost, we've lost that. So we have a ways to go to understand the very early evidence of, of dinosaurs. Uh, but in any case, uh, these, these groups, that, you'll see this image within the paper as well. Uh, when, when did they stop um, for their um, bipedal motion or quadrupedal motion? When did they stop placing the foot flat on the ground and start actually like bending it? The foot in all of these cases is always going to be flush to the ground. Uh, what is going to happen in some places, like with the sauropods, is they're going to put a big pad of fat underneath it so that they don't squish their own oh, uh, ankle. But in this one here, uh, what they actually end up doing is landing back on their hands and they end up landing back on their hands in such a way that they keep their fingers pointed straight down, so that's why you get these column of bones. But they should, and you'll see this with, with chicken um, footprints, you should see a flat footprint as opposed to just the toes uh -huh. when you look at them. So they really do walk with their feet planted yeah. flatly on the ground. Yeah. Now if they're running really fast, that might be different, but they really do want to have their feet squatly on the ground. This is a little bit different for this group here. Sauropods are very, very cool, and they also all have this big hook off to the side, this big claw off to the side, which is the only finger they really retain on that hand that's distinct, and we don't know why. But that's this sort of all sorts of neat stuff that's going on with sauropods. We're going to deal with them later. It turns out getting to the body size of our herd of elephants is really difficult. This is a good member, this Pizanosaurus, this is a very good member of a primitive ornithischian. These are very small. You're talking about things that are on the order of chicken size to a little bit bigger, maybe turkey size. We used to uh, draw this animal like a lizard without any, with just scales on its body. That turned out to be incorrect because we now have fossils with actual feathers on them or feather-like things on them. So they definitely look more like this. Uh, and they're probably running around in forest grabbing and eating uh, plant material, but they're also probably eating small lizards and other mammals and insects that they run into. All right, so what we have is uh, the dinosaurs, by the point that we actually have fossils, are well diversified. So by the middle Triassic, they're fairly diverse. Uh, in here, they're, they're really starting to, to branch out and become really separate lineages at this point. We're adding a lot of speciation. And then by the time that we reach the upper Triassic, they've probably covered all of the Earth. They're well diversified. They're filling lots of niches. They're actually a fairly strong component of many of these faunas. So you'd actually include them if you were doing surveys. Uh, for different animal species or how the, the ecosystems work. Um, and it's at this point that dinosaurs get a huge landfall. So they got lucky here in that all the mammal-like animals got wiped out, right? We lost all of our thecodonts and, and uh, they died in our giant ball of fiery death, which was the end Permian extinction. And then right at the end of the Triassic, we're going to have another extinction event. So don't evolve during the Triassic in general. It's not a good time. Um, the Triassic is... is is sandwiched between two very, very large extinction events. I'm not going to go into the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event very much. Part of that is because we don't actually have very much information about it. It seems to be related to climate change, but it seems uh, to, it, there aren't a lot of records at that boundary that we have good information about right now. It's massive in the sense that there's lots of death, but it's much smaller than the Permian. Uh, and in this case, maybe 50% maybe of species go extinct. There's somewhere about that. This is smaller than the, the Cretaceous-Tertiary extinction event. 
Plant fossils don't seem to suffer terribly through it, and dinosaurs seem to get through the event with sort of minimal losses. They, members are lost, species are lost, but no groups are lost. They seem to just power right through it without a problem. So uh, that's good for dinosaurs because almost all the other archosaurs seem to drop out at this point. They get walloped. Uh, and the only lineages that really make it through are your crocodile and crocodile-like things and your pterosaurs and dinosaurs. And so it's at this point that dinosaurs will now move from being a minor component to some small component of the fauna to being uh, the actual dominant large-bodied animals. And so now, from now on, we're going to deal with just the Jurassic and Cretaceous, and we're going to deal with just the big guys, right? We're not going to look at really, really small guys so much anymore. We're going to deal with these much larger-bodied animals like these, right? Your classic dinosaurs. We're going to deal with things like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus. And this is almost certainly not the case. Stegosaurus almost did, certainly did not protect its young. But we're going to, uh, we'll talk about why or why that might not be the case. Great. Any questions about this?